Hi, we're here in my studio. This sort of alludes to what some of my studio looks like. Um, and I'm here just to, here my wheel, this is my pottery wheel. This is an electric wheel, certainly not an amenity. The historical potters really knew and understood. So this does sort of change it, but what I want you all to see is talking about a common form that stays in American production from when pottery was starting to be made here all the way to modern day and that's the jug or the bottle and we're going to talk a little bit about that form how it changes and some of the cultural relationships we can see through the materials used to make those jugs and those pieces of pottery so first we're going to make a jug or well, i'm going to make a jug you're going to watch so i've got the wheel pretty much centered up the wheel the clay the clay is here in the middle of my my wheel head and I'm doing what's called centering so it looks really simple it's a little more complicated than that and uh, takes a lot of practice you know this is where I always having some problems with my wheel here I always like to remind people that historic potters were engineers they were chemists they understood their clays they understood where they came from they understood what firing temperatures they could go to they understood their glazes you know they had to know how to build not only their shops but they had to know how to build those kilns or know where to find the people to do that um, so a lot of that went into pottery making and, and especially in the kiln development and the industry itself the, the financial industry of building a pottery um, and I think that's something to really keep in mind when we look at historic pottery. It's so easy to approach historic craft in a contemporary sense, but it's hard to separate ourselves from what we know today and how we operate to how things were done historically. So I've got my clay centered, and that, if you see there, it's pretty well centered, uh, meaning that when I put my finger up there, it doesn't really run around. It's not wobbling. Um, and I'm going to open it. I'm sorry I don't have an overhead camera opening it which just means that I'm pressing down into the middle and creating a hollow form so jugs and bottles are my favorite form to make I just love how they come together how they essentially grow out of the making process and how it really um, is just a beautiful form for when it comes together. Uh, I love the ovoid shape, and we'll talk a little bit about the shape of jugs uh, here shortly, um, but that ovoid shape where you have that rounded curve on the side is so appealing. So now I'm doing what's called pooling. So I am pulling up that clay and making that wall. So my fingers, are close enough to one another on either side of the wall that they're making that clay thinner. I'm going pretty slow. Now historic potters, we get a sense from some records that while we didn't have an apprenticeship system here, we did keep certain things like having a separation in the production line. And we probably kept that for quite a long time until we really industrialized pottery making toward the second half of the 1800s and 19th century. Um, so before that, you really probably had somebody making the pots. You had somebody um, preparing the clay. You had somebody uh, firing the pots. You had somebody putting handles on the pots. So um, even in a small setting, um, everyone may not have done everything like we do today potters today generally know how to do everything but like it is in um parts of china where pottery production is still separated i think we still we saw that too historically um so everyone didn't necessarily know all aspects of pottery making um, maybe they did generally but they could find a way to do that and have access to it um so i'm trying to place myself so you can see this so this is awkward throwing 101, so be warned if something happens. 
And you still see my throwing rings, so sometimes these are called throwing rings where you can see these bands on the outside. So we're gonna get rid of those now. This is done with a rib. Um, historically, they really did use animal ribs. Uh, a lot of times though, you were, would see them made out of wood um, and sometimes other materials. But um, this is why you see throwing rings often on the insides of the pots and not on the outsides because typically they're smoothed down. So again, I'm gonna try to place myself so you can see this. I'm gonna go up the side. And I'm laughing, and I'll show you why I'm laughing here in a minute. So I already see my error. You're gonna see what my error is. So, why am I saying I have an error already? I'm saying I have an error already because if I were making a piece historically right now, this jug is set up to fail. Why is that? Why is this jug set up to fail? This jug is set up to fail because Historically, potters didn't use kiln shelves. Today, oftentimes you see potters using shelves in kilns, and historically they didn't have those. So we're gonna talk in a little bit about what they did use. But because they didn't use kiln shelves, they stacked things on top of one another. Today, there's a sort of grouping and movement of potters working with wood kilns who call that tumble stacking sometimes. I uh, think that's kind of fun to see contemporary potters thinking about this very dynamic method of stacking when in fact historic potters were doing it for centuries. So kiln shelves, as we think about them, weren't really developed until the later 19th century. Um, and so before that, they used pieces of clay in different shapes to put the pieces in the kiln and stack them. And we'll talk about it again about that. So now I'm doing what's called collaring. Um, I'm collaring, I'm bringing in that clay and I'm forcing that clay and I'm kind of torquing it into a smaller shape. So when you see broken jugs, which is one other reason why I love the jug form, um, oftentimes you'll see right up here this really tight spiral. And that's because you're seeing that pushing from the outside to make that clay, to force that clay right back into a smaller shape. Clay doesn't always want to cooperate. Now, I said earlier that I already set this clip piece up to fail. We're gonna see here in a minute, why did I do that? How did I do that? So one of the key things to making a jug, if I were in fact making a jug historically, would have been that I should have kept a lot of clay right here and made sure that I had a good amount of clay here and a strong shoulder. And that's again because it's gonna be stacked. It's gonna get stacked and another piece is gonna sit right on top of it. So, can you guess why I already set it up to fail? When I, when I was making it, excuse me, when I was making it, I didn't think, or I didn't plan ahead. I didn't have enough clay. And so now right through here is really thin and we're gonna see it. So first though, I'm gonna put a line right through here. Sometimes on pieces, you will see this line on the shoulder of a pot. It's not decorative, typically. If you pay attention, check out where the handle ends. Oftentimes that line on the shoulder of a jug matches where the handle ends. And I think that also tells us that the person who's throwing it necessarily wasn't making the handles too, because they may have been making the pot, passing it on to somebody else and telling them, hey, here's where I want that handle to stop. That's where it should go. I had to step away for a minute, forgot 
another tool, my wire. The wire is why you sometimes see spiral designs on the bottoms of pieces. The wire is also a great hand for doing this. Grab it. Woo, there it goes. So, I set this jug up to fail. Look how thin it is right through here and through here. So if another piece sat up on top of this, like it did when I cut it, it would collapse and probably would collapse right about there, right where you see that change in the thickness of the wall. And, and just looking at the shape and the form, you know, sometimes, I'm gonna peel this away, sometimes archeologically, you'll see jugs really super thick right down here. This is where the wall starts forming. And um, I've seen that archaeologically at kiln sites and other things. And sometimes that also, and it's not necessarily that the potters didn't know how to throw, sometimes it has a lot to do with clay. Clay can be really temperamental sometimes and it can be hard to pull up. So sometimes you leave a bit of clay here in order to support a wall up here. So it may be the potter, but it may also have more to do with the clay that they were using. So there's my dismantled jug. Now we're gonna go take a look at some kiln furniture. Well, I'm back in my cozy corner uh, here in my studio and just wanted to talk for a few minutes about kiln furniture. I mentioned when I was throwing the bottle that historically potters didn't use shelves. So the development of shelves like we see today when potters stack their kilns um, really came about in the later 19th century. And so prior to that, and this is me talking more about salt glaze stoneware. Uh, other potters used kiln furniture too, um, but a different context. But uh, salt glaze potters had to use kiln furniture, uh, not only because they didn't use shelves, but because in a salt kiln, when the kiln is firing, the um, sodium that's put into the kiln, salt, uh, combusts. So over 2000 degrees, salt fluxes and it combusts. And when that happens, that sodium vapor adheres to the silica in the clay and that makes glass. So if you didn't have something between the pots, it turned into a giant glass sculpture. So we don't want that. So they used kiln furniture and these are pieces of kiln furniture um, from various kiln sites. Um, and they look really esoteric, but they actually have some very specific shapes. And what's really fascinating to me about kiln furniture is they also kind of allude to some of the cultural differences uh, that you see in the potters, uh, especially here in America. So um, prior to 1790, 1800, from what I've seen on kiln sites, a lot of the jugs, this is again why I love jugs, this is that ovoid shape. So nice um, curved edge, small foot, wide shoulders. Um, narrow neck and um, narrow top. So um, as I pet the ovoid, <laughs> um, a lot of jugs here in America uh, were made more like this shape um, well up until steamboat travel and train travel. And so then as that happens, you see the sides start to um, become flatter as they come out. And so when they become flatter, that's also uh, what you're kind of, you can kind of date pieces. Typically a lot of potters post Civil War, American Civil War, really aren't making a lot of ovoids because of how they're being shipped. So pots can ship a lot better when they have those flat sides. Um, and so uh, the ovoid shape is, is more of an earlier shape, especially here in America. And so to, to fire these pots, um, pre and uh, pre seventeen ninety pre eighteen hundred and you'll see why I'm saying that. Before that, here in America, um, they were using kiln furniture um, to stack these, and for jugs specifically, they're typically using what I call an English style, and that is taking a flat bar, sticking it up here on top, and there's one bar on top. And then what's cool? is there's one bar on the bottom. So a bar and a bar. So two jugs are sitting on top of one another. And what's neat is you can see where that neck of the bottle sat there. So there's where that bottle is. So this style, I call an English style of, of stacking. 
as you typically see this with English potters and um, typically have English potters here in America tend to have that bar shape on um, on their kiln in their kiln uh, collections but also showing up with their pots and the other pieces that you find are these sort of dumbbells these are going to go between the pieces um, on the bellies and shoulders you see usually see a, a thing there a thing here you might also see a shape like this they're like little fortune cookies they also are used you might find um, patterns on pots with these little horseshoe shapes so those are there too what's really cool though is in Germany in the late uh, 1700s there's a new style of kiln furniture being developed and I would love to look more into this, but that kiln style, kiln firing style, the kiln furniture comes into use here in America around 1800s when we start seeing it in some of the kiln sites. And that's using what we sometimes call a jug stacker. So these start showing up in Germany and then they make it here to America by the 19th century. So unlike that bar up on top, this is a, a thrown piece, cut edge, and that's gonna sit up on top of the shoulder of a jug. So here I'm going to reach down here. This is a piece from Cincinnati. And you can see this has had a jug stacker sitting up on it. So that jug stacker would sit like that. So next piece on top of it. And then on the bottom, so the jug stackers often have sometimes three or four pads. And on the bottoms of these pots, you can see here one, two, three, four. That would have been the base of the other one. So what's neat is that development, and this comes from Germany, so where we start seeing these here in America have sort of a mismatch of German and English potteries. Um, in Germany, you did see potters using tiles of clay, but not quite like the English style of using a full fat bar across the tops of the pots. Um, so. A change in kiln furniture in the 19th century, but it also shows some of the cultural influences showing up. And what's neat about this jug stacker, and I'm going to show you a piece I made, is why that uh, difference in color is because when the kiln is firing, and this is sitting up here, this top part of the pot is not getting as much oxygen as the rest of the kiln. And so you can really see it here. This was fired in my kiln and really short firing. So it didn't get any salt, but it also is a lot um, different color. And in these kilns, which uh, tended to be really big, these kilns were so big that they were fired for several days, meaning that the oxygen was cut down and um, it would reduce or draw the iron out of the top here and so oftentimes up here is darker so this is usually a darker color than the rest of the pot because it's a difference in oxygen where that jug stacker was sitting so when you see that difference this often is a sign that a jug stacker was used in the kiln firing and that can not only give you an idea of the time frame when they were made usually about post 1800 um, but also the possibility that they may have had someone with some German influence uh, or some training with Germans um, having developed this with them. So kind of a neat, uh, simple background with some kiln furniture, looking at the jug, one of my favorite forms, and uh, a little time here in the studio. So thanks.